Hello and welcome to Kei Chung Public. We are so excited to see so many of you here today and um, the looks you are all turning are fantastic. So thank you for that as well. Uh, my name is Christy Roberts Berkowitz and I am currently a Kei Chung member and organizer of today's event. And I am also a witch and artist and lots of other things, generally unpaid, um, but not unprofessional, you know? Um, and we have some amazing guests with us today. I'm going to go ahead and read their bios directly from your programs, in case you would like to follow along. San Yu Estelle, there, is a claircognizant soothsayer that is also known as the word witch because of her deep love for word origins and word culture. She is known for her straightforward card reading style and her way with words via writing, speaking, and singing. Sanyu identifies as a pigmented womanist, sissy, flexible, asexual, travel apt, and fashion forward, sarcastic social justice warrior. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's one of my favorite parts, so. Amanda Yates Garcia to my immediate left. Um, these people are all friends, by the way, so this is exciting. Um, Amanda actually uh, started your first uh, radio show on K Chung, which is now Between the Worlds, a podcast. Um, Amanda Yates Garcia is a writer, witch, and the Oracle of Los Angeles. Her work with has been featured in the New York Times, the LA Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the London Times, CNN, Bravo. I love that episode of Vanderpump Rules, as well as a viral appearance on Fox. She has led rituals, classes, and workshops on witchcraft at UCLA, UC Irvine, MOCA, the Hammer Museum, LACMA, the Getty, and many other venues. Amanda is the host of the popular Between the Worlds po podcast, and her book, Initiated, Memoir of a Witch, received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and Kirkus, and has been translated into six languages. Mishinka Faruntskopian, next to Sanyu, is an Armenian-born writer, artist, researcher residing in Glendale. She is an associate professor of technology and social justice at Art Center College of Design. In 2021, she was a Mellon professor of the practice, of the practice at Occidental College, where she co-curated the OxyArts exhibition, Encoding Futures, Critical Imaginationaries of AI, with Meldia Yesai. Yes, a young. Prior to this, she held a two-year teaching appointment at UCLA's Department of English. She holds a PhD in the history of art from University of Pennsylvania with Avi Alpert and Danny Snelson. She makes up one-third of Research Service, a collective that pursues performative and practice-based forms of scholarship. Performances and projects have been presented at the Palais de Tokyo, Institute of Cont Contemporary Art Philadelphia, Drawing Center, Judson Memorial Church, the New Museum, and elsewhere. Her book, Algorithmic, Algorithmic Bias Training, Lectures for Intelligent Machines, is forthcoming from X Artist Books. And last but certainly not least, Honorata Vikram, is a writer, curator, and educator, and DJ, by the way, which they need to add to their bio because they just learned how to DJ and they're very good. And DJ. Vikram's book, Decolonizing Culture, helped initiate a global movement to decolonize arts institutions and monuments. They have written for art periodicals and publications from Paper Monument, Heyday Press, Rutledge, and Oxford University Press. They are an editorial board member at Extra and an editor at X, at X Artists Books. 
Vikram is faculty in the UCLA Department of Arts. They hold an MA in curatorial practice from California College of the Arts and a bachelor's in studio art from New York University. We also have with us today Peter Siminski, and um, you have been appreciating these magical pyrite radio sculptures in the plaza that are re-broadcasting our uh, sound today. So please make sure that you check those out. And um, we also have amazing refreshments today made by local witches and even our DJ is in the witch tradition. So, Zuri Adio back there. Um, so we just want to start today by we, you know, it's a short one, so we're not really getting into, getting into the dynamics of conjuring. Um, but we just kind of want to start in general by asking, what is a witch? And kind of, do you identify as a witch? Um, I think of a witch as someone with an inclination and curiosity towards self-determination. Um, the how they get there is where the witchcraft is. Um, and I think that that description could be said of an artist or a feminist or, you know, et cetera. Uh, and I am a witch. Um, Amanda? Yeah. Really? You yeah. Can, okay. 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 Hi, how, who out there defines themselves as a witch? Raise your hand. I want to see some witches in the house. All right. Okay. So we're among friends here. Um, yeah. So there are many different ways to define witchcraft, but I'm going to be speaking today from the perspective of a practitioner of witchcraft. And witchcraft is something that is very local and very personal, and there's no like Bible of witchcraft, there's no head guy who's like telling us how to do things. And so I can only really even speak from my own tradition of witchcraft or the way that I practice it to say what a witch means to me, but witchcraft for me is very much defined through practice, which means um, working with the deities, working with the land, um, being in service of relationship and reconnection and practicing re-enchantment. So that means reweaving the webs of connection between all beings and all life on earth. And that happens through a specific set of practices, such as conjuring with herbs, for instance, or spirit flight or trance work or ritual regarding the moon, rituals with each other, like celebrating specific holidays, recognizing the inspirited aspect of place, animal, river, plant, idea. Um, so for me, witchcraft is very much, a witch is someone very much who practice says witchcraft, and then also identifies as a witch, or maybe someone who says, I am a witch, three times out loud. Oh, I know, we each have our own. Yay! Um, well, if you've been looking at the screens, you'll see a bunch of screenshots that I had sent. I am the word witch, and I am a word nerd. And so I obviously looked up the etymology of witch, very mysterious word, appropriately, um, from largely unknown origins. So, so is hunt, um, technically, and hunter as a result. But... The definition I like to go to for which is the proposed Proto-Indo-European for which, which is to be strong or to be lively. Um, but other definitions for which have been soothsayer, which I identify as, um, which is a truth teller, a specific type of witch, yeah. And also, I love what you said because it actually comes from to practice witchcraft. The term witch comes from the verb of the practice, right? Um, and so I think of it in that way. I also am Taoist and I practice Ifa, which is the indigenous tradition of the Yoruba people of what we now call Nigeria. And in Ifa, the group that is often most described as the witches is called the Iyami. But another word for the Iyami is the mothers. And they are a part of the judicial system of Ifa. So, um, 
much like furies, which I believe come from the Yoruba tradition, um, the Yami distribute justice and exact justice, and they are divine retribution, but they are also divine blessings. And it just really depends on how you act, which is the kind of witch you're going to get. So I do think that witch is a verb, and totally agree with Amanda on that point. Okay, yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I owe, I was saying to Sanyu and Anu, uh, my existence actually to witchcraft because uh, before I was born, my mother happened to go to a seer in Yerevan in Armenia who was a coffee ground reader, which in Armenian we call Bajak Nael, and saw the face of the person who would be my father in, in her coffee cup. And a few days later, my mother was at a gathering and saw that face and said, that is the face in the coffee cup. Um, a series of events without which I might not be sitting here today. So my understanding of the definition of witchcraft comes from these kinds of Swana cultural practices and specifically Swana diasporic cultural practices um, that were practiced by women like my aunt, who was also a coffee ground reader and an herbologist, um, that sociologists like uh, Karina Georgi have called um, domestic forms of knowledge making and matrilineal practices that are passed down to preserve knowledges that would otherwise disappear. And then I also have a more sort of theoretical or historical understanding of the witch that comes from thinkers like Silvia Federici, who's an uh, Italian Marxist feminist, who talks about how the witch emerges, or the idea of the witch that's passed down to us emerges in the 16th and 17th century as the European feudal economy is transitioning to capitalism and the threat of a woman who exercises bodily autonomy, who retains control over her reproductive capacity is identified as a danger to the uh, sexual division of labor, to gendered hierarchies that define um, masculine-coded people as waged workers and feminine-coded people as unwaged people who perform invisible, undervalued, and uncompensated work. Um, so putting all of that together, I would say that the witch is someone who cultivates knowledge that is a danger to capitalism, who performs work that is a threat to capitalism, and whose ways of life are ultimately a threat to those systems. Do you, do you identify as a witch? Indeed, I do. Um, okay, well, let me start with the question, do I identify as a witch? And I'm really still thinking about that, actually. Because to me, the whole concept of a witch and the way that it's framed, I know that we're going to get into it when I say this too, is, is very Western and it's very Christian and it's very um, European. And I have been trying to think about, I mean, I definitely, you know, have, my mom used to say that she had the power to predict the future and that when she was a kid, she had like several instances that she would always draw on and say like, this is when I was a child, I predicted that this would happen and it happened. My mother also has extremely strong psychic abilities. Um, she's a psychiatrist by profession and she can like just absolutely read people. Um, and that is a skill that I also have and it's one that sometimes really scares people when I use it. So I have certain powers, right? But. I don't come from a cultural tradition that has a clear role for a witch. And I think even, you know, I'm also Swana, like Mashinka, but even between the, between the Armenian tradition and the Indian tradition, Armenia is just physically so much more in proximity to Europe that this kind of terminology maybe fits. Where when I think about the Hindu tradition, I think about, you know, first of all, a thousand years of patriarchy just obliterating any record of what those alternative practices might have been. I think about, you know, we have figures like demons, rakshas, who by a different telling are actually, you know, just colonized people, are people whose practices have been forbidden. Um, and I, I think I first studied witchcraft as a college student. I took a class about the anthropology of witchcraft, which was really interesting because we looked at things like um, where the farm boundaries were located of the women who were accused of witchcraft in the Salem trials versus the people who did the accusing. And when you look at the property maps, you can very clearly see that there was a land grab going on where basically these women whose husbands had died had left them property and in the Puritan system 
Uh, it just wouldn't do for a woman to have land and therefore power. And so there was a kind of a collective effort to seize it, right? So when I think about this, I think that a witch is someone who has um, knowledge that is not the currency of the dominant system, right? And oftentimes witches are persecuted because the dominant system is actually trying to make the knowledge that they have into currency. And I think with Federici, we read, for example, about medicine and the professionalization of medicine being a big place where um, in order to basically turn doctoring into another capitalist profession, um, women who had knowledge of how to prepare herbs, how to give, deliver babies, how to heal wounds, etc., were pushed out of the process and deprofessionalized so that men could professionalize. So women often carry the witch label because the knowledge that we have is, as has been said, outside of that transactional system, right? Maybe that means that it's unwaged labor that we're performing, but I don't always think I'm performing unwaged labor in this respect. Like I think as an educator teaching decolonial knowledge that isn't represented in my institutions, I'm already practicing a kind of witchcraft, right? Punching above my weight class, as it were, working in disciplines that certainly when I was at the age of a graduate student were not being taught anywhere. And if they are now, they're often being taught by people who've actually been studying it for less time than I have, just by virtue of the way that those systems work, right? So to bring this knowledge in and have it perpetuate, and I never have the power I need, but somehow what I need to do always happens. So I don't know, you guys tell me, am I a witch? Like, maybe. <laughs> I, I would like you. I would like to call you a witch. Yeah, if you claim you me, then I guess are. I guess yeah. I accept. We yeah. welcome you. <laughs> yes, please. Well, I mean, I guess this gets to our next question, um, which originates in the how do we determine who is a witch? And oftentimes, that question has been left up to the people who persecute them, um, because. Oftentimes, somebody could be a practitioner of magic, what they believe to be, which are, which are often just like folk rituals. Or um, so, you know, I think often of, um, I always ask my students, how many of you have written your name next to a crush? By show of hands. By show of hands. Witches, all of you. Like, you know, because that's sympathetic magic. That is that is trying to will something that you want into being by creating some sort of physical manifestation of it. And so, like, humans engage in magic all the time, right? And, and even those of us uh, who are the most devout of some sort of orthodoxy will probably written our name next to a crush of some kind, right? And so this goes to ask, like, what then is a witch hunter? Because oftentimes many people who are not witches are accused of being witches for practicing magic and magic itself has a really wide range of definitions and applications and processes. So then the next question is kind of what then is a witch hunter? Yeah, let's start, let's start with Anu. Okay, what's a witch hunter? Wow. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the term witch hunt has been used a lot recently. Um, and certainly, you know, our former president liked to toss it around quite a bit, right? But then hearkening back. So let me, maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll break down the witch hunt as a political tool a little bit, and then I'll kick it over to someone else. Um, so when I think about the use of witch hunt recently, right, the, the 2016 to 2020 witch hunt, as it were, um, was a way of trying to align with an earlier time, right, when it was actually, I think, Richard Nixon who introduced that terminology into American politics when um, he was trying to claim that there was no actual crime committed at Watergate um, and that he was just being, you know, needlessly persecuted for his beliefs, right? Um, and so, right, the original witch hunts, witch hunts go way, way, way back in the literature. I mean, the witch hunts, as far as I know, the first widespread occurrence of witch hunts in Europe coincides with the Inquisition. And it really has to do with the Christianization of Southern Europe, the forced 
Christianization in the wake of the Crusades and purging certain practices. And something that happens is that um, because Christianity is a syncretic religion, what that means is that certain elements of practice that are not Christian can be made Christian. But the priests get to decide, right, what is going to become Christian and what's going to be now the devil's work. And so those early stories, for example, of right, German witches in the woods dancing with the devil, et cetera, come out of these pre-Christian rituals that usually it was women who would maintain, who remembered that history, remembered those practices. Um, and then they would sort of be surprised at the fact that this was now illegal because something else that they did that to their mind was part of the same system, the same cultural structure, the same practice, that was encouraged, right? Burning the Yule log is okay. That's now part of, Chris of Christmas time, right? But, you know, dancing around the fire at Halloween, that's, that's the devil's work, right? And so um, the decisions are being made usually by people who are colonizing, right? So therefore, they're not being made with a deep understanding of the cultural traditions that are being decided about. They're actually being made more with a superficial visual understanding of this looks like this other thing that we do, and when we do it, it means this. So this other thing also means that. Um, and so there's this kind of loss in translation element that's very much at the heart of the witch hunt, because what that does it destabilizes everybody because you actually don't know how to be in compliance. And then it's very easy to selectively prosecute people on the basis of other things, like you want their land, or they said something in town meeting that you didn't like, or you, know, you bought a poultice from them and then your child died anyway, right? So these different kinds of um, retribution, right? So just to understand what a witch hunt ultimately is, right? I mean, the, again, the majority of witch hunts were actually um, in situations where people had converted from Judaism or Islam to Christianity in order to not be um, driven out of their home, not have all of their possessions and their livelihood taken away when the regime changed. Uh, and yet they would often, still at home, continue to maintain their religious practices in some way or another. And so witch hunts are actually about rooting that out, right? So it's about assimilation and conformity and control. It's interesting that you bring up that um, somebody heal did a healing and it didn't go as expected. There's actually, this week, I love a Lucy Worsley investigates on PBS. I am, I'm really, I'm like, a, I'm, a, I'm such a, I love PBS. Um, and uh, the new one this week re was released was on witch hunts. And she looks at Scotland and one of the, the first women who was persecuted under the witch hunts in Scotland um, was a medicine woman for the local community. And they had resisted turning her over to this really gung-ho witch hunter guy who was trying to try... King James was really trying to be King James. Mm -hmm. There was a storm. He was almost killed at sea. And they found this woman who was a medicine woman of the local community. And the community wouldn't give her up until she went to heal someone and it didn't work. And the, and the guy clearly like wanted his money back or something and had convinced the town to now give her over to the witch hunter, mainly because she went. And then the other things, and you, li you see it listed in the law in the taxes of like her court records of how they got her. It was that she was persecuted for witchcraft that didn't work at the same time she was also listed as being persecuted for a healing that did work. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. yeah exactly. So And of course, you know, again I mentioned the Inquisition and that was Southern Europe, but in the what is now the UK um, with the Druids and the Gallic influence and the various different, the communities of Scotland, of Wales, et cetera, right, that there was a kind of a Britishization that happened that drove that same kind of persecution. Yep. Yeah, I'd even say that was driven by the Romans, the Romans. Um, because actually, if you look at the definition of which, in the beginning, the definitions are not negatively Connotized, they don't have any negative connotation. And then around when Rome gets Catholic, the the language changes. Even they said there's an uh, original translation of the either the Torah or the Bible that calls the women who took the 
baby, uh, the baby Jews in Egypt and save them. They called them witches. So there's historical reference to this being a positive term. Um, the etymology of hunter, also of unknown origin. Um, er, that um, suffix is to belong to, and then hunts, one of their oldest definitions is to seize, right? So a hunter belongs to the seizure of, and if which is to be strong or to be lively, the seizure of those who are strong, those who are lively, which I think lively is an interesting word in and of itself. But with the hunters, I think it's also interesting because they belong to the seizure of. And that makes me think of all cops are bastards because you're in a system that doesn't allow you to do your job in the affirmative. And so you too belong, like you are also seized. It's not just who you grab out there. It's the fact that you are in that role and that that is your life and that is your job and that is your title and that is your identity. And um, to go against that systemic identity would usually involve you being a part of the system on the other side, <laughs> imprisoned or affiliated with a witch or um, otherwise sort of put down. So a witch hunter is someone who is of the belief that they have to seize people for doing what they're doing in my loosest definition um, in terms of the etymology. So that would be mine. Mashinka. Yeah, so many fabulous things have already been said. The only th two things I would add are one, that there was a very strong element of class encoding in the witch hunter. So in the 16th and 17th century context, uh, you had to be a member of the ruling class or sanctioned by the ruling class to make a viable claim about someone being a witch and to have that claim taken seriously. And secondly, that there was also a sense in which the witch trial was a legal mechanism, right? The classification and stigmatization of the witch comes after the criminalization of the witch, after the passing of several laws that identify the witch as a criminal entity and make her a target uh, to be hunted. And so this goes back to you know my earlier comments about um, the advent of capitalism really being built on a uh, form of gendered violence, right? Gendered violence and sexual violence, and that the idea of the witch and the witch hunter is using a legal mechanism to criminalize and target these populations. So, I'm, I'm especially excited for Amanda's answer because I feel like you exist at the locus of kind of both the old fashioned witch hunt and the current, the contemporary landscape of witch hunt because you have actually been witch hunted. <laughs> For real, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, there's so many things that I want to respond to there. So many fascinating and really true, rich um, responses there. I mean, my my area of expertise is really mostly in like Northern European forms of witchcraft, um, and one of the reasons for that is because um, I'm. I'm trying to trace my own lineages and understand, you know, my own roots and where I come from and why I'm here. And also not to steal from other people or not to take from other people. But a lot of the persecutions of witches, for instance, in the British Isles were happening, especially, for instance, the, the very virulent ones that were happening in Scotland. Um, as they were transitioning from Catholicism to Protestantism. And of course, Catholicism has a lot of ritualistic and magical qualities. And so there was a sense of the political class trying to empower themselves and, just, and claim right to ownership of the land or right to rule essentially by saying, we are no longer Catholic, right? We're, we're severing ourselves from the church in Rome. And so obviously they're trying to eradicate a lot of those old practices that relate to Catholicism. But it gets very complicated then because the people, like most, as you're saying, Nishinka, like the, the people who are practicing witchcraft at the time, or sorry, the people who are practicing Catholicism, um, really clung to those old rituals of Catholicism, right? They, they, 
they mattered a lot to them. They, they found it much easier to relate to the saints, for instance, than to this abstract God. They, they liked the rituals. They, they often would use, in fact, um, like uh, catechisms or uh, prayers in a ritual sense to, for instance, um, charge a herb. They would like say a uh, Latin prayer. And they did not know what Latin meant, but you know, they couldn't speak Latin. But, but you, a lot of witches even today use words that don't necessarily have a meaning, like echo, echo, azarac, echo, echo, zomalac. That has no meaning. A lot of witches use that that chant because it has power and it has resonance. And whenever you're chanting something that, um, that if they're taking the, the power of the church, which, which for the average person in the wilderness or sorry, in the, in the villages is going to have a lot of power for them. The church had a lot of power, but even the Catholics, as you mentioned, the Holy Roman empire invaded England and they, they forced people to convert to Catholicism. So this was after hundreds of years of forced conversion to Catholicism, where they were still practicing it in an enchanted way, in a, in a folkloric way. And then before that, the Vikings were there, right? And they were um, enforcing their own religion, which the people also liked more than you know, what the Romans had done before the Holy Roman Empire. So you're t we're talking about a, a, a people who had been conquered over and over and over again and forced to submit to colonial rule. And the people in the countryside were practicing folkloric forms of magic. And a lot of people will argue now that there is, like that witchcraft doesn't really exist. And that when witches say like, oh, we're part of a lineage that goes back for hundreds if not thousands of years, like, no, it begins in the Inquisition. And that is very true that during the Inquisitions um, and the persecution of witches throughout Europe, which did exist in the Southern Europe, and of course in Northern Europe, for instance, the Malleus Maleficarum, which was written in Germany by, you know, German uh, Catholics, essentially. Um, and But then those uh, witch hunting rules that were written down in that book were used to enforce witch hunting throughout the world. And then when the British came to the United States, one of the first legal actions was in the Salem witch trials where they were already starting to set up um, much of the legal procedures that we see today. And of course there were um, enslaved people accused of witchcraft in the Salem witch trials. And there were also people who um, you know, like widows or people who were, um, you know, very vulnerable within that culture whose land they wanted to seize. But a lot of the time people argue, oh, well, so they weren't really practicing witchcraft, right? They were Christians. Your, your ancestors weren't witches, but they were absolutely practicing witchcraft. They were, they had folkloric practices. They, they would use chants, they would use charms, they would use spirit flight, they did leave offerings, they did have a sense of what the fairies were and what ancestral magic was. They just maybe didn't call it witchcraft, but neither would anyone here if they knew that they were gonna get hung for it. And, and they just had a completely radically different ontology or understanding of what Christianity was, even than the dominant classes. Because in, in Scotland at the time of um, the persecutions of witches, the dominant classes thought of, you know, the Heavenly Father as one thing. But then, you know, the, the, the folk people, the people of the villages thought like, yes, there's a kindly old man who kind of grants you wishes. And there's a young shining man who is, you know, a lord of the sun. Like, so when they thought sun, they didn't think, you know, son of God. They had a completely different frame of reference. So there's all of that, and it gets really complicated, and it goes way back, and there's a, lot of different, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But I think in terms of like contemporary persecution of witches, as you were saying, Anu, you know, there, are, there are witches that are being persecuted all around the world, in Africa, in Indonesia, etc. But you know, obviously I can't speak to that, I'm not there. But here, what I feel like is particularly pernicious is that witchcraft has been robbed of its power. By, by being turned into um, a capitalist pr 
projects where the very real impulse of witchcraft, which is to connect to the land, which is focused on relationships, which is focused on the enchantment of being and the numinous nature of reality and the animistic qualities of, you know, all of reality and the sacredness of the land, is then turned into something that you can buy at House of Intuition or, or, or Zephora or Whole Foods and completely robs it of its real power. And, and witchcraft has a lot of power. And when they say witch, witchcraft, you know, witches will come for your children. Introduce your baby girl to magic. Like, let her have a tarot cards. She will become a witch. Like, it has that kind of power. And so, so when we're talking about witch persecutions today, or at least like witch hunters today, they are the people who are trying to sever us from our connection to our own innate spiritual knowledge and authority and from our connection to the land and our connection to each other. Also, you know, Jesus worked miracles. <laughs> so their Messiah is a miracle worker who turns water to wine and creates many fish and many breads from nothing. So magic, witchcraft. And also witch and warlock came from the act of witchcraft. So, um, I often think of the witch hunts in Europe as also kind of an origin of our surveillance culture and um, how witch hunters entering into communities that were tight-knit and had their own symbiotic relationship to each other and their own kind of web um, suddenly are surveilling each other for heresy and whether that heresy be like, we had a town weirdo and nobody ever cared about the weirdo and this witch hunter came and now we care about the weirdo all of a sudden and now we're pathologizing the weirdo and naming the weirdo and giving the weirdo a title and this is this exact kind of weirdo. And so I think that, um, I also think of the witch hunts as kind of the origin of our current kind of surveillance culture where we then surveil each other for heresy uh, we don't even need the witch hunter to enter our communities anymore because we then are each other's witch hunters by surveilling each other for any heresy. Whether that be like, this person is, shouldn't be dancing right now. I don't know why they're dancing. So I'm going to take my phone out and I'm going to record a video of them dancing and I'm going to post it online because look at this weirdo. Nobody else is dancing. They're clearly weird because they're dancing. Like, how is that not... Right. And so I'm wondering, like, you know, what are the remnants of these things? Like, what are the repercussions, the effects that we see today on our culture um, from everything from, you know, sacred knowledge of reproduction to um, and how we can prevent reproduction if we want to and how that sacred knowledge is persecuted to maybe how we then treat each other for ideas of heresy and whatever we define as heresy or any of those kinds of things. And I know that I've just introduced a very narrow range of topics, obviously. And so, um, and so feel free, <laughs> feel free to, to pick up whichever of the many little tennis balls I have just set down, if anybody would like to start. I, so I was thinking as you were speaking that um, the early witch hunts were also coinciding with the birth of, of like demography as a practice and the flourishing of uh, practices of collect, uh, collecting data about populations and developing classificatory mechanisms for classifying populations and specifically classifying deviant populations. We obviously see the vestiges of that now. I think if we were tr to try and think of a sort of ideal avatar of the contemporary witch hunter, it would be the data broker. And especially the data broker uh, in the aftermath of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right? The data broker that follows your every move, that traces all of your online activity, that keeps a log of your searches, that knows what your period data is because you use a period tracker, that knows if you've done a search for uh, an abortion clinic or contraceptive methods, and that sells that data later to police departments and state officials who will and have already in this country used that data to prosecute 
and to successfully prosecute uh, people who have tried to take control of their reproductive capacity. Uh, so I think that we see the lineage of that all around us. But uh, old ways and the exercise of control over one's reproductive capacity has survived for a very long time and I believe will continue to. Yes, to all of that, to everything that's been said here. Um, to me, the surveillance aspect that has been become most obvious and dominant to me is the reliance on aesthetics as the primary or most informative means of giving information, right? Like, they looked like, <laughs> because they were wearing that, that, may, that color means, and the over-identification with aesthetics um, and how things appear, how they're supposed to appear, and when they're supposed to appear, and to whom, and for what. And, um, and in, particularly, in particular, the surveillance aspect is also in this idea that there is something to correct, that there's something that even if you don't practice something that somebody practices, that that's wrong. That's the surveillance aspect that comes with colonization um, because I'm Belizean, I'm Ugandan, even though I practice Taoism and Ifa, which have nothing to do with either of those cultures. But, um, you know, in these traditions, we have medicine people, we have what they called the witch doctor because they were mostly men and men can't just be witches, so you need to give them a more official name, so now they're witch doctors. And these are people who have been the healers, staples in the community, have a role that they've always played, and it was with colonization that this role became scrutinized under not even Coptic Ethiopian Christianity, but under the Roman Catholic Christianity, which is not even the original Christianity. So there's this authoritization that comes with the belief in the justification of colonization, the need for colonization. Um, and that has given and extended to everybody this, this moral or ethical barometer by which they believe they can decide who is belonging to correct culture and who is not belonging to correct culture, whatever they might define that is. Because the way that people have been defined as witches has been such a broad spectrum across cultures that it could include practically anybody, in, depending on the time and place that you are in. So, so I want to add to that, in the terms of the definition of who is a witch hunter, I would make a case for people who practice cultural appropriation um, as opposed to knowledgeable absorption and reflection of cultural, cultural mixing. Um, and I mean, I'm speaking from, I think, um, maybe perhaps a similar place to both Sanyu and Amanda on this in that um, I'm a person who experiences my own cultural practices sold back to me by white American culture on the regular, right? And so even a practice like yoga, which is an ancient Indian tradition that has been, you know, spread throughout Asia, right? Like I have exclusively taken yoga classes from white teachers for the most part, right? And almost never from teachers who are South Asian. But even if we are South Asian, it's like we're still learning it back from colonizers, if not from white colonizers, then from the patriarchal Hindutva colonizers that we are dealing with back in the home country. Um, and what this brings me to, and actually a question that I wanted to put to you, is around the experience of having to learn your practices back from people who have stolen them, of having to, I think in this way, um, although I'm not indigenous, I look to indigenous peoples and how indigenous communities, having had so much knowledge stolen from them, are having to piece it back together through a combination of oral histories, research, external research, trying to find yourself in the archive, find yourself in the record, and also reclaiming practices that have been commercialized, like sage burning or dream catchers or what have you, right? And so um, I do want to hear a bit about the experience of learning um, and I think Sanyu, you also mentioned right being having a specific cultural origin, practicing different African practices, right? Like because you have to learn it from wherever you can get it. I want to hear about yes. that. Yes, I would just quickly say I totally agree. I mean, I'm fortunate in the sense that 
practicing Ifa, I have learned at the very least from black Americans. So it's reclaimers reclaiming reclamation, you know, it's like inception in that sense. Um, and, you know, we're, we're reclaiming it together. So there's a community that I think is provided through practicing something like Ifa that I can't get, you know, in a in a yoga session or something like this. But certainly I have with Taoism learned from a lot of non Chinese, Taiwanese, depending on what you believe the origin of Taoism is, because that's contested too. Um, and I had to actively make a choice to purchase specifically and to find classes from people who were descended from the traditions of Taoism once I realized that I was inundated. I mean, Stephen Mitchell wrote a very beautiful Tao Te Ching, but it's not, he doesn't speak Chinese. It's not a translation, it's an interpretation. And it's very poetic, but it's not his business. So I had to go read from people whose business it was. And so there's a lot of money spent in the reclamation of cultures and piecing things together, even like indigenous heritage, because of blood quantum, you're not gonna find a lot of indigenous people in like blood databases and stuff like that. And you know, you have a, a picture and an item and a story and you have to piece that together yourself. You have to pay ancestry.com just for them to sell your data to a private company. So there's a lot of recolonization and reabuse in the process of reclamation but they're siblings, so it makes sense linguistically to me. Let's hear from Amanda, and then uh, why don't we open it up for questions? So I'm going to give another kind of sprawling ADD answer, but I'll do Excited. my best. <laughs> One of the things that first pops up for me in what you're saying is, um, you know, I had a, a lover who made a film in um, Tahiti, and he said that... Um, the Tahitian people had, a, the, it was growing in popularity to have um, like tribal tattoos. Uh, and he was making film that was including those, these um, kind of tiki sculptures. The people, the indigenous people of Tahiti who were doing these tribal tattoos only had the patterns for the tribal tattoos from this German book that had been written by like an anthropo a German anthropologist during the time of colonial conquest of Tahiti. And many of the streets in Tahiti still have French names and they have a French government and French school systems. They don't know what their ancestors were doing with the tikis. They still make them and they're trying to find they're trying to figure it out and let the tikis speak to them, right? To let the power of that voice, that ancestral voice come through them to try and understand again what their ancestors were doing. And of course, that's a really obvious example of colonialism and the, um, the horrors of colonialism that, you know, that they don't know what their ancestors were doing. And also the passion to know and the passion to connect to one's ancestors by using those tattoos, even though they don't know what they mean, but it's like a way of connecting to who you are, where you're from, what the land is speaking. And I, I would argue that, you know, the way that, the, the, that we feel this today, like each one of us feels the separation from land, from story, from ancestry, from family. Like, do we know the lullabies our ancestors were singing do we know the plants that they were eating? Do we know the stories that they were telling about their, their gods? Do they know what we, they called the local rocks, flora and fauna? You know, do we know how they were chanting, how they were experiencing their spirituality? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a hereditary witch. My mother was a witch. I come from the West Coast tradition of reclaiming, which comes from... Um, essentially like fairy magic, which is spelled F-E-R-I, uh, which is a combination of Appalachian folk magic um, and, you know, British traditional witchcraft and also a lot of cultural appropriation, which, you know, I grew up singing and chanting um, things that I later found out in my practice were like indigenous or like Iroquois chants. And I didn't know that, but I still grew up singing them. So how did I, how, like, I, 
I and you and we all are steeped in these cultures and we don't know where things are from and, and witchcraft is inherently syncretic and witches in the 15th century in England even were practicing syncretic math magic. It was Catholic, it was part Druidic, it was part um, you know, just random folk magic that they made up on their own or that the spirits of the land spoke to them and told them how to use because in most, um, you know, indigenous cultures, whether it's like vegetalistas in, you know, Brazil or, you know, people in, you know, Mexico working with like mushrooms or whatever, like the, the, the spirit of the plant speaks to you and tells you how to use it. The spirit of the animal speaks to you and tells you how to relate to it. But the way that we experience today is that we're all so alienated and afraid and alone. We don't have a sense of belonging. We don't have a sense of like, I am safe here. I am welcome here. I am needed here. I know this place and it knows me and it wants me. And then, you know, at least from the part of, you know, white people then go in this hungry way, try and like acquire that from other people and meanwhile destroy and kill them. And then it just keeps going on and on and on. And so for me, the practice of witchcraft is about that, you know, and the practice of re-enchantment re is about that reconnection. And a lot of indigenous people here, like when I've gone to speeches um, from the Tongva, from the Keech, from the Chumash, they're like, find your own relationship to this land. Find your own spiritualities and mythologies to this land. We built these up over thousands of years. And they're advocating for that, partially, I'm sure, to, have, to avoid having people appropriate their own um, practices, but also because they know that that is how you hold the land as sacred. You do ceremony on the land and it becomes sacred to you. You make it sacred. You enchant it by chanting over it. And if we don't do that, then we don't treat the land as sacred. Then we don't treat the world as sacred. And so we have to develop those. And one of the reasons they're saying, please go develop these, is because they actually care about this land. They have history here. They know the songs of this land if they haven't been completely destroyed. You know, they know the names of the mountains and the, and the reasons why they have those names. Like, um, there's a place in um, Malibu called the place where we rest in the sun or the Eagle Place or the Poison Ivy Place was, I guess, around here. And so, like, they have this long relationship that tells them how the land has changed by the very names that they use. We don't have that language. We don't know. There is no, like, language that we all have that we came from that we can recognize. So, anyway, I could just go on and on, but <laughs> I'll just end it there. <laughs> kind of plant more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, everyone here today is a prolific uh, writer and giver of information. So there is always uh, the, there are there are no dams currently uh, being built in front of the flow of any of these folks. Um, so um, you can always find more. Um, why don't we open it up for questions? from our amazing audience. So, oh, thanks. Um, now I'm intimidated. Um, so I was just thinking when you were talking about the witch hunter as m more of this patriarchal colonization you know, culture, especially now in, in the times that we live in, and just wondering what you would recommend, uh, how to work through some of the fear or some of the burnout that comes from having to be faced with that every single day. And also like from a millennium, just being for myself a woman in witchcraft, having just sort of this like, oh, like I don't know if I can do it anymore. Like how do I keep fighting this other thing not with it, but through it, so that we can teach ourselves and, and other people on how to live more aligned with what we're trying to represent here today. Um, I mean, it's for anybody. I, yeah, on the stage. I think I think rich Crafts is where I know I find a lot of that care for myself and space for myself, and um, it's like where. I often find power or strength that I don't normally have to like set boundaries or to um, 
uh, remind myself, like ground myself in my own needs. Um, I think one of the most powerful things uh, witchcraft connects us to is our own unconscious. So like listening to your own unconscious through witchcraft, I think also is an amazing place to know what you need. You tell yourself what you need all the time. And if you feel alienated from that voice, I know for me personally, witchcraft has been an amazing place to de-alienate myself from my own voice. Um, because even just going into a place and noticing what crystals I'm, I'm gravitating towards, those crystals are going to tell me what my needs are in that time that I might not even be aware of on an alienated or conscious level. Um, I might be gravitating towards the opal, and the opal will tell me I need an opal right now. Not because I necessarily need the opal itself, but because I need to listen to what the opal is telling me about what I need in that moment. I would just say, don't look for the fight. <laughs> Like, I'm not going to butcher Toni Morrison, but, I mean, she's known for saying, you're going to exhaust yourself fighting them and not have the energy to even do the thing that they're accusing you of doing. Um, but I have a little system I call, it's called polarization magnetization. I call it a quantum energetics tool, so I'm going to explain it to you to the best of my ability because I need my hands to do this. Could you hold my mic while I do Thank you so much. All right. What's attracted to me that I'm attracted to? What I'm attracted to that isn't attracted to me? What is attracted to me that I'm not attracted to? What I'm not attracted to that isn't attracted to me? And existence abhors a vacuum. So if you go away from what doesn't like you, it has all that space to fill in that vacuum where you are liked. But if you're chasing after what doesn't like you, then the vacuum is right next to what you don't like. And all you can invoke is more shit that you don't like. So I always say, thank you. Magnetization, polarization. Um, but I use this because, like, it, a racist, and my, my mother's here, she's in the back, hi mom. Um, but, you know, my parents told me at a very early age that, like, racists aren't racist because I am black. They're racist because they're ignorant. And I was like, oh, it has nothing to do with me. Oh, okay, well, that reorganizes my energy because I am what I am, existence co-signed me. You can take it up with existence if you have a problem with that because I didn't even make myself. And while I'm figuring out what myself is, I'm gonna do it away from what isn't attracted to me. So if I just happen to run into a racist, that's one thing. I'll deal with what I have to deal with. But I'm not gonna go looking for them and they're like holes and hovels and on their corners of the internet. I have to go live my life as a example of my appreciation for existence, which is the real witchcraft. So don't go looking for them. There's a lot of negative synchronicity. You'll find them. Don't worry. They'll be out there for you. But in the meantime, mind your business. Enjoy yourself. Woo! Woo! Yeah, so I echo Sanju. Like, I, I was thinking that myself, you know. I, I, well, first, I would love to hear more about what you mean by, um, by what you mean by fighting? Like, in what way have you become exhausted? Um, I, like, currently I'm in a neighborhood that's getting gentrified. Yeah. So, so just simple things like that, like my immediate surroundings and how to, you know, support the people I want to support. I volunteer at a community garden mm -hmm. and uh, Verizon came in and, and just basically took over the land that we were using. So we're literally fighting them in court. Yeah. So ju just those like immediate sort of, um, uh, you know, everyday things that we see, especially here in LA, that it, I don't go looking for it per se, but it's in my, it's in my life. So it's in my experience. And so it's just like how to, how to stay grounded and how to stay strong in that. Well, um, I've yeah. I feel like you're really getting at something so important and that we're all really facing right now, which is like the collapse and destruction of our civilization, of our planet, the like violence that we see everywhere, you know, just in that community garden story is like a whole load of violence and it's, it's really terrifying and it requires a lot of courage to decide to lean into the pleasure and the beauty. Because if we do that, this is something I wrestle with a lot myself. I'm afraid that if I do that, 
the the hungry you know powers of colonialism capitalism white supremacy will just eat everything and destroy it on the other hand i also am really coming to believe that the only way that we'll change it is if we all lean into exactly as sanju said the thing that we want to see creating beauty creating love creating connection because that system thrives in polarization and fighting it it's set up to keep us fighting and exhausted and so there's this um huge faith that's required that like if we lean into love if we lean into beauty if we lean into lean into connection with each other how do we know that they won't just come take everything and you know faith is not easy like faith is hard because there's all this evidence to suggest that we shouldn't have it but for me i'm trying i'm 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 sinking into the pleasure of being on the side of life and beauty and creating reservoirs creating refuges for life and beauty in my own community and in the world around me and trusting that i am not in control of everything and that the planet knows what she's doing it's not easy to do but uh, but i hope that that is helpful in some way um i think maybe we can take two more what did they did you yeah i want to just say something i guess yeah. i would just say that um you know one of the things i always struggled with is in the buddhist spiritual tradition right you're supposed to let go of suffering your suffering is produced by desire and if you let go of your desire the suffering will go away and i always found that that seemed too detached in a way like but if you let go of the suffering especially the suffering of others right you know in a way it's like you know and so i think we have to broker a relationship with our suffering in a way right if we let go of it completely um and we let go of our ability to feel compassion for the suffering of others then we will become complacent and we don't want that but if we allow the suffering to take over um we're not abating anything right and so we see a lot of times people who begin with the best of intentions who become so attached to the pain of being a small a, a david battling a big goliath of systems right and sometimes those systems just can't be overcome um but if we allow the suffering to become what defines us we close ourselves to everything we close ourselves to experience we close ourselves to people we close ourselves to compassion um and so i guess my only way of really dealing with that is actually you know the good old self care it's taking those times to value yourself not because of what you can do for other people how you can abate their suffering or how you can show them insight but actually just because you are because you exist there have already been so many beautiful things said i i would only add that you know i think we live in a time of extreme pervasive violence economic violence like the kind you alluded to racialized violence military violence environmental violence absolutely thank you sanyu um and you know september 12th the my country of origin armenia was invaded by azerbaijan in an ongoing ethnic cleansing campaign um that i've been watching unfold from afar and have been utterly horrified by and i've been returning to an old armenian proverb quite often which is that the voice of the people is louder than the boom of a cannon and so you can only imagine how much louder the voice of the witches would be yeah. i see one right there for first of all thank you so much for all the knowledge and wisdom you've shared it's been really uh, fantastic um so we live in this awful capitalist telescope and for many of us our entrance point or opportunities to engage with magic with witchcraft and with these forms of knowledge that are getting sold back to us that's a very common and accessible place to do it 
Can you tell us a little bit more about, on the one hand, what is lost in that so that we know what's missing so we can recognize that absence? Uh, and then what other ways are there to get in touch with your, your own sense of magic without it being sold back to you? Where are the best places to do that? What have you learned along the way about doing that? Oh, can I jump in? Your ancestry. Yes. You figure out who your ancestors are, where they come from, what lands they were on, what herbs they would have used. Did your ancestors use oak chips instead of sage? Then you use oak chips instead of sage. Did they use powder instead of like liquids? Then you use powder instead of liquids. But the further you can go back in your ancestry, the closer you can get to who you were before colonization to the best of your ability, because obviously colonization predates Europe coming. Like, there's been a lot of colonization on there. Okay? But if you don't know, like if you, for instance, we know that Johnson is not an indigenous last name. You know that Trump, Trump's actual last name is not an indigenous last name, but people don't somehow know that Massachusetts is an indigenous name, right? So like, if you don't even know where your name comes from, but you, and then how do you attach the fact that after, before 400 years, you have 80,000 ancestors buried on that land, wherever it might be, if you would go find it. So like, if you don't, and yeah, there's lots of colonizers in there, but you know, better them than you, and just be grateful that they led the example so that you can at least learn from them, as opposed to repeat their mistake, because the colonizing spirit is to forget. I don't, I'm no, I don't, I'm American. I don't know what you mean, but your last name is Johansson, which is not American, right? So it's that denial, that willingness to cut off your connection to what is, you got to reclaim that. So, you know, warts and all, all the people in the line who did things you didn't want them to do, you can at least honor the fact that it was done, that you acknowledge that it was done, that you're sorry they felt they had to take those actions, and that you will make your life an amends to that by not continuing that, by appropriating other people's cultures. And then there's ways of honoring cultures. And Ifa, we have a lot of people who are not Yoruba, and who are not African, and who are not black. But if you follow what the tradition tells you to do, and you're not the one to run to the mic to run tell that and explain back to people what it is, then you will be honoring the culture rather than appropriating the culture. That's what I can say about it. Um, yeah, I'd like to second that. And also, I'm having a full moon ceremony tomorrow night where we're working with ancestors. So if you, you know, piggybacking on that, like, come one, come all, it's by donation. It's on Zoom. You can find me on Instagram, Oracle of LA. But so um, in relation to that, like, I, I would never, ever fault anyone who's just like using the Zephora witch kit or whatever, because that is the way that we know in our culture to connect. Like we buy things. Like if we're interested in something, we buy something related to it, right? But witchcraft is very powerful and it does lead you, like you'll buy it and then it won't satisfy you but you'll still be interested in it. And so you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper. Witchcraft is not really something you can learn from a book. I know I've tried, you know, like I have so many books. I like can't, I can't even walk around my apartment. Um, but your practice really develops through, you can read the book and then do something that the book says and do it over and over and over and over and over again until it starts to speak back to you. There's a um, technique that you, you can use in your dream, spirit flight technique. It's a very ancient in um, the culture of like the, Brit the Britons and um, Northern Europe, where you, as you're falling asleep, you say, I'm going to contact a specific being, like maybe an ancestor. And if you know their name, then you, you, you say like three times, like I'm going to contact this ancestor. And then as you're falling asleep, you, um, you go through some kind of a threshold. I don't know what yours will look like, right? It's, it's yours. And, and when you cross that threshold, you look for the ancestor. And they might show up in, in any way. Like they, they might show up as a bird. They might show up as a plant. They might show up as like a glowing, sparkling cloud. Um, 
but you know that it's them because you said that it is. And you're using your imagination, right? So you're, you're, you're making this happen in your imagination, but it's happening as you're going to sleep. So then you, you start to have a conversation with them. Like you say, hi, how are you? Oh, I didn't expect you to show up like this or whatever. Make it really realistic, right? So that it's like really what you would say if you encountered like a glowing blob in front of you in a cave somewhere. And then just keep having the conversation. You only have a really short amount of time to do this because as you do this, you're going to fall asleep, right? You're going you're gonna to start to drift off into sleep. And that's okay. But so you... But so really right before that moment of sleep happens because you're shifting like the way that your brain patterns are working. You're starting to access the collective unconscious and... The, the, the spirit world is accessed through the imagination, right? The, the other world, also known as the collective unconscious, is accessed through the imagination. So you're encountering that being, and then it's going to start speaking back to you, and it's not going to be your imagination, right? So it's, it, you start off speaking in your imagination, and then it's going to start talking to you, and you, wouldn't, you didn't tell it to say that, right? Like, you start off telling it what to say. And then it's like it just starts speaking to you. And then you can just develop a relationship over time. And, you know, write it down. Like, if you can remember the next morning, and write it down. And then what's really important is that you do something related to it. So let's say your sparkly ancestor says, I love strawberries. Or they show you a strawberry, or they do a strawberry dance, or like take you to a strawberry patch. Like they sometimes don't speak in language, sometimes they speak in like symbols. So then you have to do something with strawberries very soon, like within a week, right? To say, I'm listening, and I'm bringing what you're saying into my material reality. And then they're gonna be like, ah, I hear I have, I see I have an audience here, because they've been trying to contact you this whole time, they've been showing up in your dreams this whole time they've been showing up around you all the time and you're just like blah 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 don't know what's going on here so they're like I don't know if I can get through to this person you know so they 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 don't speak to you as much but the more you start to speak to them the more your relationship starts to develop and there's so many techniques like that but it's really also about like honoring relationship with everyone around you the objects around you with the land around you start learning the indigenous names of the land for instance like start learning about the indigenous people in the places that you live. Um, because witchcraft is about relationship to the land. And so we have to honor that relationship for the people who you know, have been the traditional stewards and caretakers of this land and the relationships that they have to the land because they have a lot to teach us about that. So I just want to add to that that um, I think what you said about going inward is really important and understanding yourself is really important. But I think if you want to understand other cultures, generally speaking, people want to share their culture, right? Most people are not like, oh, this is mine, go away, right? Most of the time they're like, come, eat our food, do this ritual with us, we'd love to introduce you, wear our clothes, what have you. But it's all about engaging with those people. I think what capitalism does and what cultural appropriation and colonization does is it turns everybody's culture into a set of essentially accessories, right? Trappings that you can buy that give you a personality. And that's just not deep, right? It's not a deep way of being and it's not a deep way of engaging. So if you really want to know about a cultural practice, a different kind of knowledge system, go meet people who are keeping that culture alive and get to know them and learn from them and build relationships with them and build value in your life for them and what they bring to you, I think that's the biggest lesson, right? Like, great, if you learn names for things or ways of conducting ritual or ways of connecting with your inner consciousness, all that's super important, but I would say that's all secondary to the idea that you just went out there to engage with people who you don't already understand on their terms. If I understood the question correctly, I think two things. One, you know, I this is something that I grapple with a lot as someone who has been dislocated from a lot of these cultural practices through diasporic displacement um, and finds my way back. And uh, many of the women elders in my family who would have taught me these practices are gone. Uh, one way that I find my way back to this is through engagement with elders. If the question is about... Um, 
engagement with cultures other than one's own, then you know, I, I co-sign what Anu said and also what has been said by others here. But I would add that I think that that engagement needs to be calibrated so that the there is a direct benefit to the culture with, with which one engaging that is not one's own, um, particularly if there is an asymmetrical distribution of power between yourself and the culture and the members of the community with which you're engaging. So if you're you know, interested in learning about the, the ancestral connections to the land that the Tongva peoples had in LA, one way to do that is there's, there's a Tongva Tarxat, uh, Conservancy here that was just recently opened up uh, and every, every month they have a Saturday where they invite any community member who's interested to go and learn about the work that they do and also to participate in a monthly cleanup so that there is there's an exchange of knowledge um, in, for care and care work that's being performed by the people around them. So that's, that's the only thing that I would add, but I think that this is a really important question because there is so much that is lost in the legacies of colonial violence, in the many layers of displacement and dislocation to which many of us are subject. And, and I do think that there are you know, modes of recovery and reclamation that are available to us. Um, I, I don't know if you could tell, but another event began <laughs> at five. I don't know if you noticed. Um, so, so the sound from here is, you know, going to be uh, shaky, and we do have a DJ as well that can play some tunes starting at five. Um, so we will be here until six, and you are more than welcome to talk with us without the uh, this, um, and you know I. Uh, Recently, my, uh, my synagogue group asked me around High Holidays if I would lead the Tashlik ceremony because they were saying, oh, but we love your Tashlik thing. And I was like, yeah, but it's just like a witch, it's just witchcraft. It's not actually a Tashlik ceremony. It's like a witchcraft thing I do on Rosh Hashanah. Um, and... And what's interesting about it is it does actually fit within the tradition of this ceremony, which is kind of like letting go of your sins of the year. And um, I, I would also say that there exists this kind of liminal interstitial space of what we have inherited ancestrally. And it, when we begin to deassimilate, um, in the process of deassimilation, a lot of this knowledge comes back to you in ways that you just have to kind of listen for it. And um, it exists in this kind of both spaces of both research and just listening. But that, in my opinion, has to begin with your own deassimilation to the dominant normative culture. And so the weirder you can be, the more you can hear all of this. Um, there's, a, there's a term called the egregore, which is supposed to, the collective voice of the, any, like a symbiotic uh, ecological web or network. The egregore is always loudest when you begin your own process of deassimilation and decolonization. And I think that um, it only becomes louder over time. And that voice is a voice that is made up of your own self and your ancestors and all the spirits that come to that. And it's also made up of the collective voice of the land that you're currently on and the research that is speaking to you through your own unconsciousness. And all of these things kind of all come together and culminate in that way. And so I think that they're all equally important strategies for combating your own assimilation. Um, so given, given the event that has now started over at our a sibling institution, um, if we want to maybe move to more informal um, and you have an opportunity to ask us individually, I think that sounds everyone's. Let's give it up for Christy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
guys. Thank you. Yes. Thank you to the Museum of Contemporary Art, to Alex Sloan, who has been our courageous uh, collaborator with Kay Chung. Thank you, to Peter's Sculptures, please um, take some time. They're absolutely fantastic. We have lots of delicious, the sandwich, everything is absolutely delicious. And our chefs today work with majority foraged ingredients um, and ingredients that have previously been um, outlawed by patriarchal laws or colonial laws and things, but they have been curated specially for today, so please take advantage of that. And our DJ, Zuri Adia, is also a clairvoyant. So enjoy. Thank you so much for coming out and being interested in this. <laughs>